Thank you, Mike. So good morning, everybody. Thank you. Um, well, thank you for thank you for coming. Um, this is the as you know, this is the very first of our um, quarter technical conferences, uh, our first CoderCon, um, and it's just amazing to see such a full room. Uh, I suggest any of you who get the chance before um, before the break, just find an excuse to come and stand at the front. Just seeing this sea of faces is um, is, is is just awe inspiring. And considering you know where we where we came from, you know, less than two years ago, Corda didn't even exist. It wasn't even a vision. And now we're um, weeks away from the 1.0 open source release, um, and and some exciting things coming after that later this year. So it's just great to see how big the communities become and how much interest there is. Um, so what I want to do in this session is really set set the scene for what's to come for the rest of the day. As, as Mike said, this is this is intended to be a, a technical conference. Um, we have business streams downstairs focusing on insurance and regulation. This is the technical um, stream. And I know looking across the audience and speaking to people beforehand, there are there are a large number of people here who know Corda inside out, who are developing Corda apps, who know the platform. But I also know there are a lot of people for whom this is the first time they They've heard about Corda, and some of those, some of whom um, you're learning about DLT for the first time. So, so bear with me and forgive me for those of you who are the deep experts. This is the section where I give some context and set the day up, day up for everything else that's going to come. So I'm going to do I'm going to do three things. I almost feel like sort of Charles Dickens and um, a Christmas Carol. I'm going to talk about the, the ghost of Corda past. Why does why does Corda exist? Why are we building this thing? What problem are we trying to solve? And I'll try and get through that quite quickly. And then call to present, you know, this thing exists. It's already open source. 1.0 open source release is in a matter of weeks. So showing you what its platform is currently capable of and setting the scene for the presentations we're going to get from the developers at the back of the room who are going to go into their individual components. And then right at the end, um, just as we get to 10 o'clock and before I hand over to Simon from Intel, I'll talk about where we're going. So what comes after Corda 1.0? Um, how do we support some of the needs of our enterprise customers? And where do we go as we um, leave this year and enter into next? <coughs> Forgive me, I have a cough, so you'll hear me coughing all the way throughout this. <coughs> so, Corda passed. Why, you know, why, why are we doing this? What, what, what is the purpose of Corda? And I, I've given what I'm about to say, this, this, this short talk a few times before, but I, I don't think it ever loses its power because we, we have to answer quite a, quite a deep question, which is you know, it's actually two questions. Why does the world need yet another DLT platform? You know, what, what is the problem that Corda solves? You know, why two years ago did we realize and decide we had to go build it? But to answer that question, we actually have to answer the question that sits beneath it, which is, why should any of us care about DLT? You know, as I often joke, you know, Bitcoin, you know, the granddaddy of the, of the blockchain and DLT platforms, it wasn't designed to solve problems in finance or, or in business more generally. It was designed to solve a completely different problem. So, so what's, what's the argument for why those of us who don't work in the cryptocurrency space, those of us who work in finance or commerce or anything like that, what's the argument for why any of us should be interested in this um, at all? Um, and, and, and the answer, and, and I guess I, I like to go back to this because it's, it's often useful just to sort of remind ourselves why this space is so exciting and so just remind, certainly remind myself, you know, what, what was the light bulb that got me, got, got me into this and got me so excited? And it was, really, it was really two. The first one was that I still remember that moment and it took such a long time. I still remember that moment when I finally figured out how Bitcoin worked. You know, this, this, this strange sort of almost science fiction technology that has so many interlocking components. I still remember that time when finally I figured out how all those interlocking components, how together they, 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 they allowed us to do something new that couldn't previously have been done, how you could bootstrap a new currency, how you could allow it to be held without risk of um, confiscation, how you could send it without risk of censorship. That, that, that feeling when you finally figure out how it works and you realize a new era has been ushered in is something that you don't forget. But I also remember the, the, the sensation a few months after that when I realized that the, and I wasn't the only one, there were many people around that time a few years ago who realized actually this technology is actually far more broadly applicable. This technology that's been invented to deliver the dream of, of Bitcoin, what it's actually given us when we stri strip, the, um, you know, strip the hype and strip some of the technology away, it's given us a new way of building distributed systems, a new way of building systems where I know for sure that the system I'm running, that I control, that runs in my data center or on my computer, I know for sure that when it tells me something, when it tells me some, something is true, it tells me about some fact, I know for sure that everybody else who's participating in this consensus system sees the same thing. You know, we've, we've, we've sort of netted that down to this idea that this space is all about building systems so that I know that what I see is what you see. Now, in the Bitcoin space, it's, you know, I can look at my Bitcoin node. It tells me how many there are, who owns them, and I know that everybody else sees the same thing. 
But that idea of being able to build distributed systems between parties who don't fully know each other, don't fully trust each other, are not all controlled by the same organization, that idea of being able to build systems between them that allow each person who's running their own computer to know for sure that what it tells them is the same as what other people's computers are telling them, that is something genuinely new. So if you think about the, the, the I guess, the, the revolution that was ushered in by the internet, which is the second column of this, of this, um, of this chart, it, it allowed us to be sure that data was being transferred reliably between parties. We knew that we were able to message between people, and, and a whole bunch of innovation and, and cost savings um, um, came, came from that, that flo flo flowed from that. But it didn't solve the problem of perception. It didn't solve the problem of ensuring that each side of a trade, each side of an agreement, understood the same thing, processed these, these, these pieces of information in the same way. Um, and so it didn't solve that problem of duplication, cost, reconciliation, errors, breaks. Because just because two people have the same information, if you can't be sure they're in consensus, you don't know they've interpreted it in the same way, and you don't know they're going to take the same actions. And the, the exciting thing, you know, that light bulb moment that I think got so many of us excited about the potential of DLT independent of, of, of cryptocurrency was when we realized that perhaps this is the, just the very beginning of, of a new approach to distributed systems, where not only do we have shared communication between trading partners and counterparts and, and, and even competitors, but we also have shared, shared processing logic, shared business logic, and shared perception. You know, I, we, we can see a future where I know for sure that if I see some fact about a trade or a balance or a, um, anything like that, that I know my counterparts see the same thing. And that just wasn't possible beforehand, absent a huge amount of reconciliation or, um, or, or lots of cumbersome third parties who provided the, the, the single source of truth. So there's, there's this really exciting thing that I think got so many of us to the table. And then, but, but there's, there's a problem. The technologies that got us this, this excited and, and, and point, pointed the way and painted, painted the future, they were not designed to solve the problems that we then saw in finance and elsewhere. So there was this, this, this sort of strange period where we could see a, a new future, we could see the, these possibilities, but the technology that we had that had got us, got us to this point um, wasn't appropriate. And, and, and here's what I mean. So if we just look at some of the examples we've worked through as we were beginning to realize there was a need for Corda and as we began to, um, began to build it, there were some common things we saw time and again. So here's just a, so I just got this from Google. This is a screenshot from, from Bloomberg of, of a credit default swap on, on, on Citigroup. Um, but this is a, a typical example of a derivative contract between two parties, either cleared or, 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 or in this case, I suspect, um, not, not cleared. And, and it, has, it has some interesting properties. Um, we want the, the buyer and the seller of protection to be in consensus. If we could be sure that each of them knew for sure the status of this deal, whether the underlying had defaulted or not, who owed what to whom. If we could be sure we could get all those benefits of, of DLT, a huge amount of cost, risk, duplication, and, um, and uh, an error would disappear. But there's extra things we need. There's events we need to look out for. Has the underlying defaulted? There are conditions that need to apply. There's complex calculations. There's complex workflows. There's a need for privacy. We don't want everybody to see all the information. We just want the counterpart and maybe their regulator to see it. We need to aggregate. It's not just one deal. There's probably a whole collection of them that need to be either netted or, um, or, or valued independently. So there's a whole bunch of things we need to be able to solve as well to get the benefits of this promise of, you know, I know that what I see is what you see. So we're beginning, this is like over, over a year ago, now, almost 18 months ago, beginning to see that to get this promise, there are additional requirements and features that a platform needs to be able to address. Similarly, you know, trade finance, supply chain, um, um, international trading, you know, all that cost and duplication caused by paper and faxes and uh, ships on the sea that aren't connected to the internet, if we could be sure the buyer, the seller, the buyer's bank, the seller's bank were all in consensus about the, the nature and content of a shipment and its value, so much, um, so much new opportunity would flow, so much, um, so much cost would be reduced. But again, the platforms that got us so excited were not designed for this. There's a huge need for integration with existing systems. We have to be able to interoperate with people who are not on the network. We need an identity layer that is flat and common across the globe. If you have different identities in different countries, well, how does that work with international trade? Um, complex workflows. Complex workflows you need even when parties are not always online, because the ship could be in the middle of the sea with no internet access or very expensive access via satellites. And the ability to handle multiple different assets and a grow and atomicity. Just the requirement build upon each other, and there's so many of them. And yet again, we know we have to solve these before we can get the benefit of the technology. 
And then finally, cash, which should be the easy one. After all, that's what the original cryptocurrencies were designed to, to, to emulate and provide. Now, when you move to the, in quotes, real world, you know, cash isn't that simple. There are different issuers of different currencies. You need to be able to swap currencies, you know, dollars for pounds atomically, you know, payment versus payment, and you need privacy with provenance. So you can't just send the data to everybody as, as, um, as, as, as traditional blockchains um, work. So, so the reason we built Corda, and the, I, the reason I hope so many of you are in this room, was because we saw these two things coming together, this future of distributed systems where we can, again, to, to labor the point, we can build systems where counterparts who don't fully trust each other know that each of them sees the same thing, but we also need all these other requirements that enterprises require to be built in. And I guess the secret source or the thing that, that allowed us in R3 to, to be the firm that, 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 that invented um, Corda and, and built it with, because of this unique consortium we've constructed of, um, of financial institutions, but technology partners and more, we were able to work through a, a, a process of probably over 18 months of, of concerted work, not just from the R3 platform team, the R3 engineering team, but at its peak, literally hundreds of senior technologists from across our membership who are contributing to the design, the requirement, the evaluation, the simulation, and the prototyping of what ultimately became Corda. So, so we had this, this, we had this, we had this, this, this vision and excitement, we had the requirements, and then we had a huge number of very senior technical people who, who had tried to build these things in the past, who were advising and contributing. Um, and, and the upshot, and the reason I guess we're all here, is the upshot is Corda, which we open sourced last year, and which hits 1.0 in a few weeks. So that's, so that's, that's the story, if you like, for those of you who weren't along for the journey. So, so what's the current status? What's the, so, so that, the, if you like, that's the argument for why we built it, but you know, what's the current reality? Um, so the reality is, as I said, Corda, we open sourced it November last year, so it's been out for almost a year. We've since shipped, I forgot to check before I came here, but I think it's about 10 separate milestone releases, adding new functionality, new features, extra reliability, extra performance every month. And, and we're gonna culminate with the, um, the 1.0 release where we mark API stability um, in a few weeks. Um, but if I had to net Corda down into you know, one sentence, you know, what is it? Um, and I think this is a really important thing to, to, to grasp. So yes, it's a distributed ledger platform, it's a blockchain platform, but what makes it different is, one, it was designed and built from the ground up, but it was designed and built from the ground up with a very specific purpose in bold on the third line, to, to record, manage, and synchronize agreements, legal agreements, contracts between parties. So this is, this, is, this is not just intended to, this is not just a data processing platform, it's intended to become a system of record for those who use it, it's intended to be legally enforceable. You know, there's a very strong and high ambition sitting behind this. Final point, we're unashamed about this and we make no secret of it. We designed it almost exclusively with regulated financial institutions. We had a very narrow set of use cases we were trying to solve and it was with the banks that we designed it. But it turns out the Corda is far more generally applicable. It's one of those really serendipitous um, sort of like um, experiences, probably the only time I've had it in my career, where something that we designed for a very narrow use case because we just happened, in my, in my opinion, in my belief, just to get the right abstractions and, and, and the right design, it turns out to be applicable far more broadly. And we're seeing people using it in insurance, in government, in, in healthcare. You just look at the questions we get on our public Slack. Um, so it's just really nice that this, this thing that was designed for narrow use case actually turns out to be generally um, very broadly applicable. So what are some of the things that, that make it different? And I'll just talk about this very briefly because what we've done with the presentations that are coming later is each of the um, developers who's going to present is going to talk about each of these. But I just want to highlight a few of them just to give some, some, some motivation for, for why Corda works the way it does. So, so the first thing is almost the prime reason we built Corda was for privacy. We looked at every blockchain platform that existed at the time and they were based on this idea of sending data to everybody. And even some of the competing platforms that have tried to solve privacy um, through, art, uh, through architecture such as channels and other things still haven't got it quite right. Um, we, we built Corda from the ground up for privacy. Um, I won't talk any more about that because Mike and Costas have got an entire section on what we currently have in the platform and where we're going. Um, and it's no surprise that our keynote is, is Simon Johnson from, from Intel who will be talking about SGX, which is a key part of our long-term privacy strategy. 
The second thing that makes Corda different is its approach to consensus. Each transaction, each trade, each, each event is confirmed separately. We don't arbitrarily bang and a bunch in unrelated transactions into big batches that we call blocks. We, we, we confirm each one independently, and you can have multiple different consensus providers on the same network. Again, something that's unique to Corda, and Andreas will be talking all about that when he talks about our notary architecture later. Um, the third point that I think is different is whenever we looked at business logic um, on other blockchain platforms and in the real world, invariably there are complex workflows. There are, there are, there's a need for, um, there's a need for negotiation, there's a need for backwards and forwards. It's not sufficient just to say, do this. You need to, you need to speak to your counterpart, maybe you need to go and get some information from somebody else, you need to make a proposal, you need to get a response, you need to negotiate. So an ability to do automated um, workflow across organizational boundaries in a way that's reliable and easy to understand is really, really hard. And it's a core component in, um, in Corda. We call it the flow framework. Uh, Roger and James will be talking about what ships in 1.0. And right at the end of the day, Dave will be talking about a really advanced usage of the flow framework to do, um, to do um, complex decentralized netting for, um, for central bank digital currencies. Um, it, it's a unique feature. And I think it's something that we need to do a lot more to help people understand. And then the final thing I'll talk about, and this is what Jose and Kat are going to um, focus on, is, is, is integration and developer productivity. It's all very well having a, a platform that, um, that, is, that we think is designed well, but if nobody can use it and if it can't integrate with anything, you know, what's the point? It, there's no point having a system that is, is, is in consensus with the rest of the world sitting in a corner of your data center if it's not in sync and it's not connected to anything else. So, so, so Corda's built using uh, messaging technologies. It integrates seamlessly with relational databases. It uses modern programs techniques to allow you to stream events out of the platform. Um, Jose is going to be talking all about the vault, how you can use, sorry, how you can integrate Corda with um, relational databases completely trivially. And then Kat's going to go one level deeper to talk about a feature that if we're doing our job right, you'll, you'll never even know it exists. Um, I won't steal her thunder, but there's an entire engine in Corda that when data comes in over the wire, if you don't have the relevant Java classes or if the versions don't match quite correctly, the work that Kat's been doing will automatically create, it will, to Carpenter, it will create the classes you need on the fly so you don't have to worry about it. There's, there's a huge amount of developer productivity pieces we put in to make it an easy and enjoyable um, and almost a delightful platform to build on. I'm not saying we've got there completely yet. There's still some rough edges as you'd expect, but it's something that we, we do agonize over. So. Um, as I say, that's what we've been building. All those things I've just talked about are in the platform today. Um, end of this month, um, team, I guess, are getting quite stressed about it, as you'd expect. But end of this month, we're still on track, I think. We'll be shipping at 1.0 of, of Corda open source. And this is a really important milestone, because this is the point at which we mark API stability. Um, so this is the point we say to people, if you code against the public API, as we continue to upgrade the platform, improve it, make it more stable, add additional features, as we, as we do that, applications written against the 1.0 API, when you recompile them for subsequent versions, they'll continue to work without having to rewrite them. Now, as we go, as we go further, in future versions, we'll offer application binary interface stability, we'll, we'll offer wire stability, um, but for 1.0 API stability, we think it's a really important mark in the sand to say, those of you who are beginning to develop, this is a, this is a stable foundation. And I'm expecting almost like just like a, almost like a, just a flourishing of, um, of additional people using the platform when we, when we hit that milestone. Now, I'm getting shouted out for having talked too much and um, gone, too, gone too slowly. So I'm actually going to skip the demo because there'll be another chance to see Corda later. And I'm going to move on to futures. And then at one of the breaks, or maybe um, later on in the day, I'll go back to the demo uh, because everything I wanted to say, I've actually, uh, I've actually already um, shown. Um, but what I was going to point out was, so I'll just say this without actually showing it. If you go to corda.net slash download, so that's corda.net slash download, if any of you haven't done this already, there's something called the Corda Demo Bench. Um, and it's, it's, quite, um, it's probably being undersold, because although we call it a demo bench, what it actually is is a fully functioning Corda network that you can run on your laptop. You download a single executable for Mac or Windows, you install it, and then with like one, two, three, four clicks, however many nodes you want to run, you can run as many Corda nodes as you like on your laptop, all connected, all, uh, all addressable, and then you can then just drop um, Corda apps drop jar, jar files on, on top of it, and you, can, and you can test your applications. Out of the box, it comes with the finance court app that allows you to issue cash and move it around. And it's a very easy way to see how the network works, see the point-to-point -point messaging, see the integration with the database, see how the flow viewer works in, 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 the, in the demo bench. So if you haven't already downloaded it, there's videos on Vimeo. Do download um, corda.net slash demo bench. It's the easiest way to get, get your head around how this thing works. 
So that's the present. You know, call it 1.0 open source in, in a few weeks' time, and then we, um, and then, um, you know, then I guess then all hell breaks loose once we told everybody this is this is 1.0. So what happens after that? Well, once we ship 1.0, um, we continue to work extremely hard on, on, on the open source code base. There are so many more features we want to put in. There's so much more work we have to do. But we also have a large number of clients and potential clients who've got some really quite exacting demands for production, um, to do production grade deployments, primarily in financial services, where they have some very specific requirements around, around, uh, around availability and um, performance and manageability. So what I'm announcing today is in addition to a 1.0 release at the end of this month, there will also be a Corda Enterprise, so a, a licensable version of Corda that will, uh, that will first ship at the end of this year and there'll be more versions next year that provide additional qualities of service for those who need, uh, who need the most exacting requirements. And we're focusing on, on three broad areas. Some of these will hit at the end of this year and some will continue be, to be delivered um, next year. So there's the mission critical things you'd expect. So, so even stronger high availability and, and disaster recovery capabilities and you get an open source, um, greater performance. Um, Andras, who I'm not sure is here, is doing a huge amount of work on making the entire platform multi-threaded and some of the performance improvements he's seeing are, um, are out of this world. Importantly, that's where we deliver Intel SGX. That's where we'll have the, uh, the, the, um, the, 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 the cannot be beaten um, privacy technology that we've been working on for so long and so hard. But there'll also be some enhanced DLT capabilities. So um, we have a, already have something we call the flow viewer that allows you to see what's happening. There'll be the flow hospital that allows you to, to graphically figure out what's going on inside the node and deal with flows that are, that, that are paused. And then from an operational perspective, um, pluggable databases, pluggable messaging, um, and, and additional capabilities for people running business networks in the future and deep integration um, with, um, with public clouds, the first one being, um, being, um, being Microsoft Azure and obviously Microsoft um, as our partner are here today presenting. So there's a lot to come in the enterprise version as well. So NetNet, you know, we built Corda for a reason. The potential of these distributed systems that bring parties who don't fully trust each other into sync and maintain that consensus is just, it's just, it's just jaw dropping in its potential. But to do that, we need a platform that is designed, designed for commerce. All those requirements I talked about earlier, um, you have to be able to address them or you can't achieve this, this, this vision as, as we see it. Hence why we built Corda. 1.0 ships at the end of this month. Um, look out for the announcement of that. That's when we give API stability. And then watch out for a blog from me next week, an official announcement, and then um, delivery at the end of this year of the first version of Enterprise. So it's been, um, by, the, by the time we get to the first version of Enterprise, it will be almost exactly two years since the the first line of code for Corda was, uh, was written by, uh, by Mike, who's sitting here, so who's sitting just here. And it's been astonishing to see just, just, just how much has been delivered and, and how fast the team have done it. So just really proud of them. And it's, um, it's, been, it's been a great, great experience. So with that, I'll stop talking to let the people with the real content get going. But I think I've probably got time for one question. Will, will the slides be available? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that was an easy one. Yeah, that was an, not even a chill. <laughs> I like easy questions. <laughs> Who's got a hard question? I, I'll give you a hard question. Uh, how, how do you see R3 differentiating itself between all the other frameworks? You kind of alluded to that, but you want to see this. Yeah. Basic, well, I think you heard me too. Okay, I think the question was how does R3 see itself differentiating itself versus the other firms? So I guess there's two things to that. So how does R3 differentiate itself and then how, does, how is Corda different? Because I guess they're not quite the same thing. So, so from Corda's perspective, um, so I'm under no illusions. You know, I've worked, you know, I, those who know me know I worked for, for, for IBM for 15 years in, in various software roles. And the lesson I learned there, I guess, as anyone's ever learned in software is you know, it's not enough for the software to be, you know, the, the best technology doesn't always win. The, there's a, you, have to, you have to have the ecosystem, you have to have developers, you have to have support, you have to have the right, the right understanding of clients you've got to have the right timing, you've got to be in the right markets. There's so many things you have to do, it's not enough for the technology to be good. But if the technology is good, you've got such a better advantage and we're very focused on that. Uh, and Corda is the only platform against all the other enterprise DLT platforms that I see that has been designed against a set of use cases that we think are valuable and people will want to, to, um, to, to solve, number one. Uh, from an R3 perspective, um, so I guess I won't go into too much detail um, um, 
on, 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 on the bigger picture. But the thing that I, I and the reason I joined R3, you know, back two years ago when, when I joined, the, the, the fact that R3 has this really interesting mix of a really, really deep technical team. I mean, just seeing, seeing them standing at the back of this room, you know, probably the, one of the best engineering teams in, in technology, if not, if not so, so, so in technology, and certainly in DLT, but combined with this really large investor base of, sort of, of the world's largest financial institutions and a much broader membership. So we get the use cases, we get people who genuinely want to collaborate um, to figure out you know, how are we going to apply this technology? Is this the right approach? Um, what, what, it, how do we get this thing live? Because unlike any other, te any other technology I've ever worked on, DLT is, is not something that one firm can really do by themselves. Multiple firms have to move at once. They have to collaborate, they have to cooperate. That doesn't come naturally to firms, certainly not to banks. But what we've shown over the last two years is through the right construct, which we deliver through R3, uh, banks who by, who by rights should be competitors, where it makes sense for, for their markets and their customers, they can collaborate for a better outcome for themselves and their, and their clients. And we've shown that time and time again with all the projects we've been running, and Corda is an example of that. So I'm under no illusions. You know, we, okay, we're very well funded, but we are just a startup against some very big firms. But I think our approach to co collaboration, our approach to partnership, and our approach to technology, I think, is, 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 is certainly what gets me, uh, keeps me excited. Do I have time for one more or not? Uh, I gave you five minutes extra, so yes. Oh, well, okay, one last because question then, go on. Okay. You're, you're mentioning the competitive positioning of R3. Uh, what should we take from the fact that various uh, of the previous batches of R3 are no longer supporting you? So I, talk, so I talk about the position of R3. What, do you, what can you take by the fact or the, 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 the assertion that some, some backers are, are no longer part of us? I'm not sure that's, that's an issue. So we, we are a, so we're a membership organization that raised, um, raised funding um, a few months ago. Um, membership organizations, members come when members have had the value they want. There's no, there's no, there's no, there's no requirement for them to, to renew. Um, I think from the, um, the proportion of members who chose to invest, I don't think there's any other Series A of our, of, of our scale that has such a diverse um, investor group, you know, over 40 investors in, in a Series A of our size. Diversity um, in terms of numbers, but also diversity geographically. Um, it's almost evenly split between Europe, Americas, and, and Asia. So I think the, just like the, 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 we shouldn't be under any illusions. The effort it took, you know, David um, at the back, the effort it took, the effort it took David and the team to get, to get the, the, the deal done was, was immense. But to bring that many of the members along, I think, is, is unprecedented. And of course, those who didn't invest, the vast majority of them and many, many more who have joined and continue to join remain as members. It's, it's, it's totally unprecedented. So with that, I'll, um, I'll hand back to Mike. Thank you very, thank you very much. Yes. Yes. Yes.